these poems are from Gentle Housework of the Sacrifice, a sequence I've been working on uh, since 2021, when I was very ill during the summer and still only gradually recovering. Hot Springs Dissociation. The window when I can do things is very small. The auxiliaries that lights up, drink, bet and brawl. Lilac, amber, lapis lazuli, light up their dreams. I look for another century. They game and steam. That secretly set in the bathhouse, the Roman bathhouse at Bearsden in Glasgow, which haunts me, not least because the glass which has been found associated with it, I would not have recognised as Roman. It looks very modern, it's an extraordinary range of colours. It is medieval, and the quad behind that is the remains and built on the very old sort of monks' yes. college. So th that little square back there would have yes. been the Christian heart of it. Oh. But if you go behind there, that's the remnants of the medieval Jewish village. Yes. Mixed up with some 1960s architecture. What I'm interested in will be the smell coming from that time, yeah. particularly the cooking smell, that mm -hmm. will be, because that will be carrying the cultures from different continents. Well, I think there's quite a fish smell around St. Aldrich's. That, that's where the markets were, where the, the Jewish markets in yes. the 13th century. I wonder what they were doing with the pond. I've never seen that happen before. I wonder if it's just sort of a bit of cleaning. Well, they've got koi carp in there, which were given by the Emperor of Japan. So I don't know whether they have to take all the fish out. Yes. Put them back in. Anthony, it's an absolute pleasure to be in Christchurch, Oxford, uh, to talk to you. Hello Tess, it's wonderful to be here and I've never had quite this view before, so it's a novelty for both of us. It's a fantastic view and you were talking to me about this building earlier on, about what is underneath and uh, some, some remnants of Jewish sort of um, uh, mosaics and glasswork. It wasn't so much mosaics and glasswork as the actual Jewish town uh, which existed before the expulsion in 1290 in England. Uh, so it's thought the synagogue might possibly have been somewhere under the canonry, if not the town hall. And definitely there are some streets underneath what's now the main quad of the college. Uh, however, there is a medieval house in Blue Ball Quad, uh, which otherwise looks very 20th century, that still has the original glass. Uh, I've been told that that's the remnants of a medieval Jewish merchant's house. I think much more could be done, I hope much more yes. will be done, to honour and uncover this history. It, 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 is, it just seems like a, a fantastic and fascinating place to, to be in. A place of so many layers. Yes. Right, if I may ask you a few questions, please. I read that your earliest poems were scribbled on a telephone pad. I'm interested to find out how poetry started for you. That's a very good question and something that I keep changing the answer to. I used to say that uh, it started for me with this telephone pad uh, which belonged to my mother who had the habit of sketching faces uh, and making notes and lists and all sorts of things uh, and I rather took her habit up. Uh, so I don't have any pure poetry notebooks, you know, I always find a silly little animal or, or a recipe in them. And uh, when I was two years old, I had taught myself how to write uh, by imitating letter forms and books. Uh, and I wrote, one, two, I love you, one, two, three, I am a bee, on that pad, and it was my, my great achievement. I'm not sure that's how poetry started, though. I think it might have started uh, with just hearing language around me and hearing the way there's a great zigzagging variety of rhythm and pitch in Trinidadian language. I, I hesitate to say dialect, but it's a mix of Caribbean standard English and dialects which will refer to various bases. And what were some of these languages that you heard? I heard my father chanting Sanskrit and I heard Hindustani from my mother often swearing because she knew quite a few different words that meant unfortunate in different ways. For example, unfortunately clumsy, 
unfortunately heavy-handed, uh, unfortunate as of cursed by witchcraft, etc. And uh, my father's uh, dialect, however, or language would have been Bhojpuri. And that was interesting because they had different words, for example, for book or even for the word and. Then one of my mother's best friends was a nun from Madrid, Madre Marina Barbero, who had come over to work with the sisters of St. Joseph of Cluny and taught my mother at her convent school. And uh, she'd never properly learned English, but she was a brilliant and fierce Spanish teacher who joined the convent after her father was shot in the Spanish Civil War, shot on her birthday, so she never used to observe her birthday. Right. And uh, I remember that she simply would talk Spanish to us until we understood it. And <laughs> that, that was quite a lot of fun. Yes. And then my mother also had studied in French in France, uh, and she had friends from the French Creole community. So there was a mix of French French and the peculiar, slightly fossilized French that would have harked back to the 18th century families. And uh, in the island, I think there's still 600 families, or that's 600 people, that have French as a mother tongue, according to the International Organization of Francophonie. What fantastic sounds and languages to be involved in as a child and kind of growing up within the tradition. I think that must have been where the poetry started. Uh, because all of these languages have different tunes uh, and the tune of French would tend to push things uh, further, push stresses further towards the end of the word, uh, whereas English seems to be evolving Germanically to have stress further towards the front of the word. And one thing I love is when I hear poets from St. Lucia because they speak English with a much more French intonation. So I don't mean to mock them, but it sounds to me as if they say, I am from St. Lucia. And the stress is all flowing yes. towards that last syllable in such yes. a French way. Fantastic. Um, if I may ask you another question. Um, experimentations in form, perspective and identity are bound throughout your collections. I've noted the use of multiple perspectives. I was wondering if you would say a little about this, please. The multiple perspectives was something that I began to theorize uh, when I was in my teens uh, and uh, I wrote an entire binder of poems when I was here at Christchurch as an undergraduate in the 1990s, uh, which I then destroyed, uh, where I was partly trying to process things uh, through, through tr channeling voices. Uh, so I tried to speak the voices of people around me or of dead authors I was reading, or ghosts I could imagine, and also the non-human. I was very influenced at that point by Robert Browning and the idea of a dramatic monologue. And I did show this to two or three of my friends, and I had a friend here, Katrina Carew, who was a composer, a music student. I used to give her poems to set, but she, she just did them, I think, for her homework and never showed me the results. And. Uh, I gradually started wanting all those voices in one poem. And I'm not sure where that comes from. I wondered at first whether it was from reading epic uh, or quasi-epic, like Beowulf, uh, where the perspective shifts around. Uh, but la more lately I've been wondering if it comes from the split consciousness uh, of growing up in a post-colonial independent nation. And I started wondering this not to do with poetry, but when I was enjoying uh, some horrible comedy and a friend of mine said I can't believe that you watch that it's so racist so homophobic it's so transphobic and then it struck me that I hadn't thought that comedy was presenting those attitudes I thought it was presenting those attitudes as something to be mocked and that our point of view wasn't supposed to be shared with the characters that our point of view was supposed to be in the kind of niches and byways and in between the lines and on the margins. And then I realized that the comedy I had been enjoying, it was in fact bigoted, uh, and that I had learned a kind of post-colonial contortion. I don't want to say contortion or squint because that sounds ableist or, or overly kinetic, uh, but a, a kind of way of always reading slant, uh, of assuming that what the speaker was saying wasn't in good faith, uh, that we had to see around the edges, uh, that we could never laugh with, uh, that we had to laugh in spite of. And, and I believe that with the poetry that there's something about that, the multiplicity of the voices, uh, 
being the voices that undercut each other and also the voices that can never be spoken, the ones that are beneath any conversation. I'm not interested in the kind of thing you could say at the breakfast table. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in the sort of things you could never say, words that don't even feel like words. Dr. Sears, Dr. Sears illustrations, Dr. Sears, of course, is again quite a racist illustrator, but he had this one of the rug under the rug, which is a sort of bluish, grayish, purplish night scene in a children's book. Right. The rug was sort of humped up like this, and there was a rug under the rug, which was like the monster that inhabited the under rug hump. And that's sort of what I felt about language, that language was inhabited by rugs. It was never smooth. Thank you. Um, if I may get to my next question. The idea of a home and displacement appeared to be of interest to some poets who've spent significant time in different parts of the world, um, as you have, but uh, your approach to home seemed to incorporate multiple shells, layers and cultures and maybe even influences. I wondered if you'd like to say a little about this. It's interesting you say multiple shells. I immediately want to be very naughty and tell you that I did in fact have a collection of shells and also a collection of stones. Because as you might know, Trinidad is on the Gulf Stream current. That's one of the things that keeps it alive, which flows from Cornwall to the Caribbean. And if you could pick up that hot Gulf Stream, which runs quickly, it used to be possible, for example, to get to the post more quickly the Spanish colonizers used to pick up that current and the ships would get the post more quickly than the British who took longer to trust the Gulf Stream yes. as something they could use with their ships. And there's some beautiful stories, for example, by the late Lucy M. Boston, the children's writer, about things like shells which can be carried between the two. So there's this back and forth between, say, the shores of Cornwall and the shores of the Caribbean. And that sort of children's literature by an English woman laid the groundwork for me to think with uh, Kamau Brathwaite's Thai dialectics from Barbados uh, and the idea that one could view life and history and the linguistic and geographical environment uh, as consisting of back and forth and cyclical movements, uh, like the tides that carry people back and forth, uh, and also flotsam and jetsam and histories and memories. Uh, rather than there being an argument, a counter-argument, and the resolution of dialectic, a dialectic. So I, I think that was where it started, literally thinking with those shells. But I know you meant shells in another sense, yes. the sense of carapace, the carapace one inhabits. And what people tend not to realize is how proper Trinidad is or was. At least I can't speak for the younger generation, but certainly as someone who was born in the 1970s, uh, there was a kind of propriety which came from British Victorianism and then had developed along its own sort of line, like a science fiction separate world. Uh, it's not that Trinidad was old fashioned, uh, but there was a separate parallel development uh, of various kinds of Victorianism, Indian Raj Victorianism, for example, or French 19th century-ness, which of course is not Victorian. And uh, so there's huge formality when I was growing up. I was never allowed to play with other children without my parents uh, contacting the other parents. Uh, I was used to going to diplomatic cocktail parties uh, and to drinking from a glass when I was two. There were proper ways to speak to one's elders. And that of course comes from African and Indian cultures as well, as indigenous cultures. They, the respect for the elders uh, on things like whether or not you look someone in the eye, that would be the South Asian diaspora. Then the North Indian thing that your legs are disrespectful. So as a person assigned female at birth, you'd have to wear a long skirt if you're going to see a holy man, not trousers. Then later I found in the West African polytheistic Orisha culture, you also had to wear a long skirt or wrapped cloth. You couldn't wear even loose trousers. So, so Trinidad in itself is extremely multicultural and it's a bit like a middle theory that the layers are always shifting from one moment to the next. You might be in a working class Afro-Caribbean or a rural Indo-Caribbean environment and then suddenly you're also in a very proper Raj environment 
or a sort of uh, we're making the clerks to rule the empire proper sort of as they call it in Trinidad Afro-Saxon which right. is not a good thing and these all intersect and it reminds me of the geography of the region it's a seismically active zone and the seismic research unit at the University of the West Indies uh, is world leading in its research and also it takes its community education programs very seriously so you can easily go and find out what to do in an earthquake you can see films about La Soufrière the continuously erupting volcano north of us in Montserrat but also just get the feeling of being at the juncture of two plates the feeling of constant slippage and the thermals rising underneath an ocean floor which is peaked not level or deep Perfume howl. True ectomorphs walk among us. Arcades of ectomorphs, scintillae, cav cavalcades of ectomorphs, street lamps, fusillades of ectomorphs, shotguns, calvaries of ectomorphs, scanners. An aeroplane walked among us, gabbling crucifixion. It came from another better land. I took you by the hand. Madam, I would not trifle with you. Would you care for a bit of bitter geranium? Spritz the air, walk into the mist. The dry down is an ectomorph. It raises a pine, a pine, a pine. Oh, in these undogly times, in this undogly situation, beleaguered by ectomorphs, in this undogly nation, hallow, cry, hallow. Adored familiar howl. Brass face were several instruments installed mistakenly as externals, peerless in bodily airways, ventilated petitioner of ecstatic unions. Is it punctuation light? Safe to say seems sound to say so. Believing that dogs will go to heaven. There will be dogs in heaven. Wanting all the dogs in heaven. There will be dogs in heaven. Not leaving enough dogs for other people in heaven. There will be dogs in heaven. Shock is writ in splash. Splash is writ in water. Water in a river. River writ in shock and splash and first encounter. Encounter. Otter. Otter and water. Always the first, as water is always new river, otter, always new otter. I was Charles Cosley poet in residence uh, in 2022, this year that we're recording, and uh, I was very sorry to see that the otter sanctuary in the River Tamar had been disbanded, uh, although the elderly otters had been either looked after or safely rehomed. But I strongly recommend spending time with otters, otters of any variety you can meet. I read somewhere about you talking about uh, carnivals and making your art among people. Um, I wonder if you would like to elaborate a little on this. Trinidad is famous for its carnival, but when I came to Oxford as a student, I always said that I didn't know anything about anything or I didn't know anything about art because uh, I had one of my very dear friends as a fine artist, Sarah Simblett, and uh, she was extremely well versed in the sort of 17th, 18th, 19th century Western European art and would take me to the Ashmolean Museum and begin to decode that for me. And I didn't realize that my ability to decode uh, the spiritual iconography, for example, of North Indian religious statuary was knowledge. I didn't realize that uh, being able to read landscape was knowledge. And I didn't realize that the ephemeral art of the traditional carnival makers, whose costumes might be discarded at the end of a year, or the art of the people who decorated Hindu temples, again, things to be discarded at the end of a religious season or ceremony. I didn't realize that that highly crafted ephemerality was in itself a form of art and a form of knowledge. But one of my formative memories is being two years old uh, and lying on the bed in my mother's room and being asked to close my eyes uh, while she coats my face with Vaseline and glitter and uses lipstick to rouge my face and paint new features on. 
because she's made a costume together with a professional costume designer and I'm going to cross the big carnival stage in a partly handmade, partly professional costume. And I remember the huge wind whipping up on the stage in the savannah and being told to look at the judges in both stands, look at both sides of the crowd, enjoy yourself, move to the music. But, but learning that the body is something that transforms. And this is why the genius carnival maker Peter Minchel always says don't call it a costume, call it a mass, a masquerade. It's not about something you put on and take off, but about something that temporarily transforms you. Fantastic. Okay. If I may ask the next question, which is uh, uh, nature and uh, environment tend to be present in, uh, what if I may say, sort of beatably abstract kind of ways in some of your poems. I wonder if you would say something about uh, climate change and what role poetry could play in addressing or at least uh, raise further consciousness of, uh, of what is going on. Well, one sort of programme which I find very hopeful is a sort of programme which uh, thoroughly pairs uh, poets or other creative artists with scientists uh, because I believe it's absolutely necessary for genuine experts in their field uh, to be able to be in dialogue with the general public. And when we look at the poets of earlier ages who are lauded in the Western canon, up till relatively recently, there were people who kept up with the sciences of their era. So someone like John Donne or Dante Alighieri would be making use of scientific allusions and philosophical language absolutely up to the minute. Nowadays, poets tend not to do that as much because there's been this great division of cultures and now, of course, a distrust both of expertise and of the humanities being fostered by the big money which prefers more rule. And one of the most wonderful programs has been on as a poet recently was one called Translating Science, where seven writers and seven scientists were paired in Norwich between the National Writers' Centre and the Science Park. And we had enough time and money to get to know each other and really to get to know each other's ways of working and how we talked about work, how the scientists already engaged the public. I asked my scientist who was a soil scientist to all sorts of questions to what was her working environment like and learned these amazing hopeful things about her field work, how she'd been looking for She's looking, looking for the soil microbiome in areas of Colombia, her native country, which was supposed to have been desertified after the war. And she found there were signs of life because the bacteria had evolved to eat explosives. And that sounded fantastic to me and very poetic. And then I asked her, what are some of the best ways to make these places fertile again, apart from the sort of computer data crunching you're doing? She laughed and said, bring little goats to have a pool. And so, uh, as a poet, I immediately realised uh, we could do a sequence of poetry which would please a family audience. So I could do one very serious kind of narrative poem about her growing up as a girl in Colombia and growing into the consciousness uh, that she wanted to become a scientist of her devastated landscape and find traces of life again. And that would be the kind of narrative poem where the story would swing along and the children wouldn't be too bored, but the adults would be following it. And then I wanted to do a little nursery rhyme about little goats having a poo. And that's the kind of uh, mutual communication which then can be outward turned to a diverse public, which I think could help raise awareness. Because as a poet, I don't think you can really... Well, it's, it's in French, I don't know what it is in English. I can't really preach and drone on about climate change. So I'm not a scientist. But I do believe that First Nations people should be the ones who are primarily consulted uh, because uh, I don't see climate change as recent. Uh, the absolute catastrophe, which is now starting to be experienced uh, by parts of the West and North that are richer, that catastrophe was experienced uh, with colonization of the so-called New World. Uh, forests disappeared, land was leveled. Uh, then, again, it's not seen in terms of devastation, but it's a huge change, uh, which has had a knock-on effect. Uh, that here in England, uh, 
places were drained, land was reclaimed. Uh, where I live in Scotland, people are still building high-cost housing on land that's been reclaimed, even though the flood map shows that land will be underwater again by 2050. Oh There's a refusal either to add up the long story with the proper knowledge and wisdom of the indigenous peoples who could have so much to say to the rest of the world. A refusal to add that up with the current planning which is going ahead in a completely disconnected way as if they were a global state of derealization. And I really do sometimes have the pessimistic feeling that the ultra-rich believe that they'll be able to jettison everything and colonize the moon or Mars and that Earth will become a discard planet just like certain portions of the third world are their discard places. Also, when, looks, when one looks, for example, at the flooding, I remember being very horrified. Uh, we're speaking today on a day when Florida has just been hit by a terrible hurricane. Oh, yes. And a friend of mine asked me to play pray for Florida because I'm a lay Dominican inquirer, so I do a frightful amount of praying every day. But I noticed that my Caribbean friends uh, are asking for relief for Cuba. Cuba's been suffering the terrible blockades, of course, from the US and other countries for so long, and yet they were leading the fight in COVID protection for the region. They've been leading the fight in helping with relief with natural disasters in the region, and now they need help, but nobody's hearing they've been struck. Puerto Rico has been struck. Loretta Collins Clover, who's a wonderful poet from Puerto Rico who teaches at the university there as a professor and also translates between Spanish and English, has done two entire collections which look at ecofeminism and environmental change. The second one voices the hurricane. So again, there's not really kind of adding up, but all these communications they have on the same platforms of social media, and yet they're arriving at different strands. The, the strands don't intertwine. The person praying for Florida, the person getting relief for Cuba, the person singing of Puerto Rico, and not in the same digital space, what Kelly Baker Josephs would call the same digital yard. How can we change that? Fantastic. Um, you're obviously interested in the role of language as your research interest in Old Norse translation demonstrates. I'm interested in finding out more about how this interest started. It might perhaps, in a negative sense, have started with that sense of uh, not knowing anything about anything. I really had wanted to read music, not English, and although I had quite high distinctions in performance and theory at grade 8, which was the highest grade in the Royal Schools of Music, uh, I couldn't find anyone who'd teach me keyboard harmony and other elements uh, to make it through to undergraduate level. And then when I arrived at Christchurch, they said very generously to me, of course, uh, will change if you want to change. You'll catch up very quickly, we'll make sure you catch up. And then cutting off my nose despite my face where I said, no, no, I can't possibly. I don't know enough music. I don't know, I don't really know anything. And in a way, being able to drill down into the sounds of language, the phonetics, the phonology, the sort of shimmer of language, the connotations of words, the idea of false friends, the words with similar roots, can go down different paths uh, in different languages. You get the good twin and the bad twin, you get the, the, the bizarre universe yes. uh, pairs of words. Uh, that is a certain way of working out of a frustrated musicality, I think, uh, that, that any interest I have in language technically does, does go back to music. Uh, one of the things I'm loving at the moment with the Dominican friars uh, is learning the Gregorian chant, uh, which uh, I believe uh, some of them think of as uh, being in tune with the natural world uh, and having the sort of flow of the cosmos uh, or the flow of sources of water and so on. Fantastic. I, um, I remember listening to a whole album of, uh, of Russian Orthodox Vespers. Uh, I think this was recorded in the early 2000s. Uh, and I remember being transformed into a different space which um, for me was kind of like a, uh, experiencing music in a way that wasn't traditionally kind of music as in harmony based but yes. based on the sound of words but 
obviously uttered in a very spiritual sense and what he's saying kind of feels very much like uh, what I experienced with the, uh, with the Russian Vespers. Yes, I think that there's a way in which even if one is anti-spiritual or non-spiritual, uh, that, that there's a way that the materiality of that sound uh, is taken seriously and allowed its vibrancy and allowed its uh, dimension and not flattened out or instrumentalized. It's the word and the sound together. It's a sort of breathing into the word. And musicality is, of course, something, whatever I read by you, that is the word that sort of a... No, it just, that's what I'm left with, that there is an, an immense musical feel to your poetry. So now that uh, you're talking about music kind of being your first inspiration, uh, it, it almost makes sense uh, to me. That's very interesting, because uh, the people who love to hate me usually say that uh, my poems have too many words, uh, or that they don't sing. But I often think that's because of an unwillingness to attune the air. Because there is an idea, I believe, among some people, a lyric poem with one identifiable voice, uh, often a reassuring quasi-neutral voice, can guide you through the poem. And I prefer to think of soundscapes that are multiple, so it's not only the perspectives in my poems that are multiple, but just as now in this recording, I hope you don't edit out, uh, there's a sound of rain on stone, yes. uh, the little echoing wind, people walking past, uh, some church bells. Uh, similarly, in poems, I never want to edit out all the noise. Uh, I always want there to be a certain amount of overtone, uh, vibration, crackle, static, uh, as it were, a little bit of bird song. And I also wonder if that's got something to do with an ecological view of poetry, that there should be an ecosystem of sound within a poem, uh, which isn't just to do with an ecosystem of various phonetics or phonologies, uh, but an ecosystem of sounds which can have different sources uh, or references. Uh, and, and the willingness to sit with that, the willingness to sit with a kind of complex shimmer of sound uh, is an, eco an, an ecology of interconnectedness and praise uh, rather than one of domination and singularity. Fantastic. And, um, who are the poets and writers, uh, or maybe... Um, other genre creative practitioners um, you have drawn inspiration from? This is going to be a weird segue that you're probably used to that by now, but I was watching the Star Wars prequels with my mother the other day and she said to me with uh, a tone of disapproval, I never know if it's you or one of those things on the screen making noises. I have great interest in these little chirruping sounds uh, and bleeps and growls and whatnot and uh, the writers I'm inspired by are often those whose poems uh, suggest to me a wildness, uh, not just a kind of ornamental or wrought iron approach uh, to language. So or I would admire Tennyson, who has that sort of wrought iron syntax, uh, or Milton, who has a kind of beaten bronze syntax, where you can see the Greek and Latin influence uh, in how the constructions twist around each other and stand up to any heat and pressure. I, I like the poets that are a bit more badly behaved. Uh, and with Jared Manny Hopkins, he used to ice skate, for example. People tend to forget that about him. And uh, there are all these fine and subtle sounds when you ice skate in the wild, uh, which I haven't done yet, but I, I can imagine them, yes. including the cracking of the ice. Uh, or someone like Dylan Thomas, who obviously would have growled and roared in his daily life. Uh, and that's somewhere in the soundscape of the poem. I'm also, also very intrigued at the moment by Sormaz Sharif, uh, partly because in her first collection, Look, she used uh, the military dictionary which was evolving and was used by the American military, and which created a sort of perverse shadow language uh, whereby ordinary looking words to us uh, had uh, very, very specific and deathly meanings. Uh, and she knew herself uh, as a, an Iranian American uh, to be someone who is permanently being described by both the white language of the everyday and that perverse militarized channel language. And she does something with her lyrics and being able to blend those two together. And then she also uses space on the page to suggest gaps in communication. Gaps not in the sense of what is missing only, in the sense of yearning across. 
Zohar Atkins uh, is another poet uh, who yearns uh, across gaps. Uh, Yusuf Kosmier is another who can do this poetics of incredible yearning. Uh, I find that in St. John of the Cross as well, if one looks back to earlier poets. Uh, and I love that very much. But uh, one can't really speak of the absence of words or the white space on the page or the failure of language, even though some of these things may be present. Uh, it's more the reaching towards, uh, a kind of tending, in several senses of tending, uh, that inspires me. It interconnection is. again, sorry, it's interconnection again. Yes, yeah. absolutely. You just mentioned uh, Dylan Thomas, and um, last month I was making this documentary on um, Dylan Thomas's place in modernist poetry, mm -hmm. but also how he drew inspiration from his own birthplace. And a friend of mine who is a writer and affiliated to the Dylan Thomas birthplace um, was telling me that when Dylan was three or four years old, his father would be just reading Dickens, Shakespeare and verses from the Bible, which of course a four-year-old wouldn't really understand, but that, those were the sound that were kind of reverberating in the study of, uh, of the Dylan household. Mm. But that's very interesting because uh, Dickens, of course, uh, was such a dramatic novelist uh, that there were all sorts of different voices. This is why he used to dramatise his own novels uh, in his own performances, uh, that there's so many voices leaping off the page. Uh, it's not at all something of levelled or flattened narration. That must have had some influence. Yes, yes. And if I may get to the uh, very final question, um, what are you working on presently, if I ask? Uh, maybe a collection or something? I've just finished a new collection for Intergraphia, a press run by Emma Bolland and Rachel Smith in Sheffield. These are very small pamphlets, a series of very small pamphlets, which look at art as well as words, as visual art. And although I know nothing about nothing, I've always doodled funny animals, the kind of animals that make, make my oh, noises. And uh, while I was reading uh, a bit about Thomas Aquinas uh, and listening to Paul Parvis uh, lecturing on Thomas Aquinas, uh, I found myself doodling these little animals uh, on the back of my Aquinas notes uh, and sometimes uh, writing small fragments of verse uh, as if an animal were trying to understand Aquinas but not quite getting there. So Aquinas, I believe, defines humans as dependent rational animals uh, and I thought what would happen if I did a little pamphlet complete with illustrations of dependent, not very rational animals. So that little book called A Happiness is coming out from Intergraphia. It's got a tree that weeps amber, a squirrel that bites the hem of a fire robe. It's got a reworking of the dream of the rude from Old English, which you know spot, but I'm not sure anybody else will. And also lots of happily whirring tales and Leviathan playing in the deep. Well, I'm certainly going to be looking forward to uh, that pamphlet. So well, when is it coming on again? It's coming out this month. It might have come out already. It's being launched in London and Sheffield in October and November. And the other thing is uh, I have the huge honour of being one of the University of East Anglia's poets in residence at the Archive, uh, together with Joel Taylor, J. Bernard uh, and Gail McConnell. So the other thing I'm working on is trying to sort out uh, some notebooks to deposit with the archive, uh, but returning to where we began, my notebooks are this mess uh, of little animals doodled, uh, the one, two, three, I'm a bee, phone numbers and recipes. Uh, I, I don't have the beautiful sequence of drafts that you could lay out under glass. I have to do something about that. Fantastic. Well, Anthony, it's been an absolute pleasure finding out uh, your inspirations and what you're working on. Thank you. Thank you. And the last poem is inspired by two historical figures, St. Francis of Assisi. He liked uh, his brethren to call him Mother Francis. And when his friend Jacopa wanted to visit him, he cut her hair and gave her a man's tunic and called her brother Jacopa so she could come among her friars. Here I'm channeling brother Jacopa. The other thing that I'm channeling is the peculiar bit of scientific knowledge that the body of those assigned female at birth or people with uteruses, or I'm very uncomfortable with all of these terms because 
I have a very unfixed relation to gender as an agender person myself. But those bodies produce or can produce a hormone called relaxin, which changes throughout the month. And for example, the levels of relaxin when one's menstruating will make everything looser. And then in pregnancy, the, everything becomes looser again, so the pelvis can come apart. But then after pregnancy, everything comes back together, but perhaps not quite in the same way. So when people think their ribs have been reshaped or their hips have been reshaped, that's physically true. The body is re itself after loosening. Profession, annunciation hormone, relaxin. What's relaxing when relaxin will reconfigure your bones by unbinding all your sinews throughout pregnancy, never the same, rebinding, never the same again. Metanoia, child's play to this blue sky, sky blue, ripping, birther of nothing, I will pick up my sword, the one I gave away. Mother Frances, I swear by my chromosomes, I'll be a decent brother. X, X. Thank you.